For Inside Carolina, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and this is Up in the Rafters, where I'm joined by Carolina basketball legend and 2017 national champion, Justin Jackson. Justin, the Carolina experience the past month has been rough. Yet last night, the women's soccer team, they lost after being up 2-0 in the national championship with 10 minutes left. Carolina football, everybody knows that's that's kind of been demoralizing the past three games. Carolina basketball, it's been just as bad, if not worse. Me personally, I've had to experience all of that. And then on top of it, for, for the audio-only audience, I'm wearing my – proudly I'm wearing my USA World Cup jersey that arrived today just, just in time for the team's flight home from Qatar <laughs> in, in comedic timing that – only I could seem to provide them in my life, but we can't start the podcast with so much negativity. So just tell me something good going on in your life right now that we could, we could get this podcast back on the right track. I mean, there's something that there's, it's always constant. Um, but my daughter did turn one, uh, like a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Um, and we had, my wife freaking did an unbelievable birthday party <laughs> for somebody that's not even going to know. She doesn't even know what happened. Um, but she's freaking growing and an unbelievable little ball of energy. So that's kind of my constant, uh, my wife and my daughter. So um, we'll just throw that out there. It's good know? perspective to have. You know, just put the good energy <laughs> out there. You know, good vibes. For Carolina basketball, since the last time we talked, Carolina – goes on the road, they lose at Indiana, and then they go on the road, losing Blacksburg to Virginia Tech. From your time at UNC, I went back and looked. You only lost back-to-back games three times at UNC, never more than two games in a row. This team has now lost four games in a row. What have been some of the common problems in the team's losses with more of a focus on the the past two games especially? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough because um... – you know, for one, coming into the season as the number one team, it doesn't really matter who you play. They're going to come out and give you their best shot. They're probably going to play their best game. Um, they're probably going to shoot the best they possibly can um, against you. Um, and it comes with a level of responsibility as far as each and every game. You have to go out there and play like you're the number one team, like you're the best team in the country. Um, so the first, you know, the first – two games um, in the field night invitation we already talked about. I mean, that's a, I feel like that was more of a learning experience. Um, but then you go right into a hostile environment in Indiana. We talked about how loud that place gets. It was rocking um, for that game. Um, and there just wasn't a level of energy and effort and um, physicality that was needed in that kind of game. Um, You know, it seemed as if Indiana was taking it to them and they were just kind of backing up, you know, as they, um, as the game went on. And so you saw that and then you saw going into a, you know, hostile environment with Virginia Tech, um, you know, nobody's going to feel bad for you after winning, after losing a couple games. And I, I feel like, towards the end of that Virginia Tech game, you finally saw some fight out of them. They kind of, you know, they were pressuring the basketball, causing turnovers, getting good shots on the other end. Um, But they have to have that the whole game. So I think coming off of the last two games, I think my biggest takeaway is just the physicality and the energy level that they play with. Um, They just haven't brought what I feel like needs to be brought to make another run like they made last year. Um, and so hopefully, you know, hopefully it's kind of an eye-opening experience and a wake-up call, um, and they can try to get it back on track. Yeah, the energy and effort's been a, a pretty big constant in, in some of their losses. And part of the problem, for me at least, when I'm watching this Carolina team, I'm like trying to watch their their body language and I, I don't really see a, a leader out there. I don't see somebody rallying them together. It just looks like five guys that are going out there as individuals and just hoping for the best, hoping for a team win, which is a weird thing to say with how much experience this team has and where they kind of came from last year. When you're watching this Carolina team, who do you kind of see as, as their leader? And from your experiences, what does and what should leadership kind of look like? 
I mean, leadership looks totally different and totally, you know, each, each, each player might have a totally different way to lead. Um, but I think first and foremost, when it comes to who the leaders are, it, everybody on that starting five are basically upperclassmen. So to me, it doesn't really matter who takes kind of that leadership role, but there's got to be somebody that's mature enough to, you don't have to be, um, you know, the guy that's saying things all the time or, you know, yelling at your teammates or whatever, but there has to be somebody that is able to pull them together when things kind of start going awry and get everybody back on track. And I think that's one thing when I watch the game, there's never really huddles between the players, you know, like we used to at least kind of huddle before a free throw or, you know, we would huddle at some point, like when things, let's just say a team goes on a run, like we might huddle up real quick and just, it might be something as simple as, all right, guys, let's get back, like, let's get back in transition or let's get a good shot or whatever. Like, so we were always connected in that way, um, whether it was going good or bad. And I never really see that with this team. Um, and like I said, it's all upperclassmen. So it's not like they're young. They're trying to figure their way out. They've been through this already. So to me, it doesn't really matter who it is. It could be, it could be somebody on the bench. It could be Tyler Nichols for all I care. Like it, it doesn't really matter to me, um, who the leader might be. And I think the leadership, it, for one, the best leaders that I've always seen, for instance, Marcus, the best leader that I've always seen is somebody that leads by example, right? So Marcus wasn't necessarily a guy who was, you know, would get in your face or he wasn't always saying something, but like you knew what he was going to bring every single game. You knew he was getting his extra work before and after practice. You knew that he had paid attention to the scout that, you know, we had for the game coming up. So he knew the tendencies of certain players. Um, so that just makes you follow in line. And I think there has to be somebody on the team that does that and carries everybody with them. And then hopefully everybody can just kind of become a, you know, more of a team when it comes to that. So like I said, it doesn't matter to me who the leader is, but hopefully somebody kind of steps up and, you know, really wants to right this ship and get it back on track. Yeah. And this, this team has really struggled on the offensive end of the court and, and the defensive end of the court, but specifically on the offensive end of the court, John Henson was recently on the field of 68 podcast. And he said, in order to run a pro style offense, you got to have pros. Let's be honest. You're in your sixth year in the NBA. You've seen now what it takes to make it and play with some of the best basketball players in the world. When we're watching this UNC team, I kind of agree with him that I don't see anybody that tr really translates to the NBA or can, you know, be a player, a, a five-year player in the NBA. What's your take on Henson's comments about the lack of next level talent trying to run a next level type offense? And, and if that even matters. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think part of that is true. Um, you obviously have to have the right players to run certain schemes and, and offenses. Um, but we've seen glimpses of their offense being able to work the way that they ran the offense throughout the NCAA tournament last year was the same way that they're running the offense now. Um, I just think th there's so many things that go into it as far as playing the right way, you know, getting good shots. Um, I think their assist number is like 10 a game um, at this point, which is kind of crazy based on the fact that they are playing more of a, you know, open style game which should be more drive kicks um drive drop offs like those are the problems that i see um i think shot selection is really what kills them at times um and i think a lot of times when you when you look at you know pros nba international whatever they're able to succeed in the pro style setting not necessarily just because of their physical talent but being able to read defenses and being able to make the right play for not only themselves but other people and when you watch Carolina play this type of system a lot of times it's just 
whoever has the ball coming off to try to make a play for themselves. Um, and especially in college when you can just pack the paint and shift off of people and all that kind of stuff, it's not going to work. And so I think that's probably the biggest thing. I think I don't necessarily think the offensive system is what's hurting them the most. I think it's the individual players making the right decisions within that system. And, um, you know, I don't know necessarily how to, how they can get better at that other than just looking for one another and trying to play together more. Um, but I think that's really the problem is, is kind of them within that system. Yeah. The, the part that I disagree with Henson's comments about, it's like, to run a pro style offense against pros, you have to have pros Mm -hmm. like Carolina should be able to get away with it at the college level where if they have, you know, a floor spacing shooter or, or a guard that could attack kind of like we saw RJ Davis and Caleb love attack last year. Like the system looks completely different, but right now for Carolina offensively, there's just a lot of standing around for players. You mentioned the assist numbers. They had five assists against Indiana six assists against Virginia Tech, uh, 95 assists to 104 turnovers on the season. And then out of 352 teams, UNC's 327th with 10.8 assists per game. That's that's really where the problems are coming from, that this team doesn't really move the ball that well, but not in a sense of um, the the system is, is really failing them. They just need to find people that can create in their system. But um, Virginia Tech, they had no Armando Baycott, no DeMarco Dunn, who led the team before that game in bench minutes. What did you see from Tyler Nickel and, and Seth Trimble as, as Coach Davis was scrambling to see what could work and, and what lineups um, would be the most effective in, in trying to close that gap? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's um, it's tough because as a freshman going into – you know, a a hostile environment like Virginia Tech, um, you know, a lot of times you see freshmen kind of, you know, shy away or, um, you know, not be as aggressive. Uh, I liked what I see from Seth and Tyler, you know, like I feel like there was a lot of times, especially when they were making that run towards the end of the game, um, there were a lot of times they were up pressuring the ball, trapping, um, I know Tyler, he he airballed a shot, but just the fact that he had the confidence to pull it at that point in time in the game, um, towards the end of the game, uh, for me, I really like that. Um, I like somebody coming in fearless um, with nothing to lose and just going out there and playing hard. Um, so I, I think that is – I think that's something that you can look at and be encouraged by, not necessarily the numbers um, and the box score type things that they brought but I think as far as what this team might need coming off the bench I think that's I think they brought what you know the start of what needs to be brought um you know for me to you know going back to you know their offense and things like that they almost have everything that they need to be able to run a highly efficient offense they've got a big that can set screens and roll they have two guards that can be playmakers coming off of those They've got P. Nance, who, in my opinion, has surprised me more than anything as far as his ability offensively to help this team. Um, You know, and then they've got guys who can space. They've got Puff. They've got Tyler. They've got, um, obviously, Dunn's out for a little bit. But they've got guys that can also space. So when I look at this team, I don't – obviously, having a Brady Manic helps a million times. But when I look at this team, in my opinion, they have everything that they possibly need to have an efficient offense and defensively to cause some problems. Um, But it's just decision-making and effort that I see each and every time, which is why I love Tyler and Seth coming in and playing the way that they did, because hopefully they can kind of be that surge whenever guys aren't going on that side of the floor. Yeah, between Seth and – uh, Tyler, they played hard. They had zero turnovers in that Virginia Tech game. They were six of eight from the field. Tyler Nickel was plus one in, in 25 minutes. For the the fan base that's like, play those guys more, play other guys less, why do you think it's it's not as simple as that? Um, for 
<laughs> I love this argument. Um, for one, my first question would be who who do you play them more over, right? Like this is a very uh, top heavy team, and so if they're sixth or seventh guy, maybe eighth guy, that to play them more over Caleb. You got to play them more over RJ, uh, Leaky, uh, and so my my. I guess at this point, you got to try something to try to get wins, right? So I understand going either way. I've been on teams where when you all of a sudden change up the rotation and you change up who's playing how much and who's playing here, sometimes it can work because guys lock it back in and they're like, all right, forget this. I'm not losing my starting job or I want to play a lot. But I've also seen it go the complete opposite way where – players can become almost like cancers because they're always complaining about their playing time. They're always complaining about their situation. Um, And so it just kind of fills through the team. And so I think it would be hard to do that with this team uh, because it is so top heavy and because the top guys made it to the national championship last year, I think it would be tough to do it. Now, Four in a row is a lot of games. <laughs> Dropping from number one to out of the top 25, that, that's a problem. So if Coach Davis were to decide to shake it up, I would, I'd be right there probably cheering it on. Um, but I think it's just tough, and it's a lot more complicated than just saying, okay, these guys are playing really hard. They need to play more than these, than these other guys. At the end of the day, what's crazy is Caleb's leading the ACC in scoring. Mondo was a preseason All-American. Right. Like RJ is right behind all of those guys. So it's tough to just say, okay, these guys need to play more. And it's their first year and they've only had a couple games with minutes. So I think it just gets a little more complicated than just doing that. So we'll see what Coach Coach Davis knows what he's doing. So we'll see, you know, what kind of things he decides to do and try to change things up. You mentioned the comeback at Virginia Tech and kind of what allowed that to happen, the the extended pressure. Why does this team look better when they do extend pressure? And is that something that you think this North Carolina team should do 40 minutes or, or try to do it for as close to 40 minutes as possible to give them the best chance to win? I think that it should be mixed in for sure. Um, I hate it as a player, but it really did when I was at school and coach would do random jump traps or he would always have the point guard picking up full court. Um, and even, even when we would be in full deny all the time in the half court defense, defense, I feel like is really what leads to great offense because defensively, when you're locked in, when you're pressuring the ball, let's say you get a steal or two, your energy level just goes shooting out the roof, right? Like, I don't know what it is, but when you're highly involved in defense, you're just way more locked in to both sides of the floor and when you just kind of sit back for one you just allow the other team to do whatever they want to do but when you just kind of sit back like you're reacting to what the other team is doing and instead you saw in that run they were up pressure and getting it past the lanes they were the ones bringing the fight to Virginia Tech which automatically gets you more like Mentally, you're so much more locked in to the game. And I think whether it is you try to do it all game, I think it's tough with a team that plays six or seven guys to pressure all game long. Um, But I feel like there should be mixed in traps. There should be guys should move the pickup lines, you know, from the three point line to maybe the volleyball line um, or maybe even half court uh, just to kind of get them going. Um, I think the energy level has been the biggest issue so far. And so getting doing things to get that energy level up will just make things even better, you know, in transition to the other end. And so I think right now, especially with this team shooting wise, I feel like they're kind of struggling a little bit. And so a lot of times when a team is struggling, you just got to find easy ways to get buckets, you know, and I think that's kind of what we saw in towards the end of that game. They were able to get out in transition. They weren't playing against a set defense every time. Um, 
and you know that kind of gets them going a little bit more so hopefully you know I'm sure coach Davis will probably add some of that to kind of get the guys you know get their juices flowing a little bit as the, as the games start um, so that they can kind of keep that going through the whole game yeah I feel like it's something that Carolina has to look at just just to kind of provide that spark that you mentioned to try to you know jump start this team and, and get them back going in the right direction but yeah, the defense has been uh, a bigger problem for this team. When you look at Ken Palm, their adjusted offensive efficiency is 11th in the country. Their adjusted defensive efficiency is 58th in the country. And it's it's kind of like a parallel to the UNC football team right now where, you know, teams are able to get whatever shot they want on, on almost any possession. And, and North Carolina is struggling to – do the same thing to other teams on the offensive end where a team takes away that, that first option and th- they really don't know what to, what to do. But at the same time, you know, Indiana, you look at, um, what was his name? Uh, Trace, mm-hmm. Tra- Trace, Jackson. Uh, Trace Jackson. Yeah. Like every, every possession he was, they, Indiana was going to get whatever kind of shot they wanted running, running the offense through them. And I don't think Carolina has that right now or has the ability to take that away in, unless they're doing that full court pressure. My last question for you. It is December 6th at the time of this recording. We've mentioned it, it's still early relatively for this Carolina team. At what point do you think can we not say that it's still early? When 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 does it kind of tip? So so the, my mindset was it's still early until ACC play. Okay. Uh, and, uh, uh-oh. <laughs> and we just played the first ACC game. Uh, we the year we won it, we lost our first ACC game in Georgia Tech. Um, so there's still a ton more conference games to be played. Um, you know, hopefully the ACC ends up being pretty decent at the top. Um, so they're able to kind of make beat some good teams. Um, but like I said, four in a row, four in a row is a lot of games. I I, I don't know if I've ever lost four in a row um, except for my rookie year in the NBA. And we just weren't that good with the Kings. Um, so four in a row in college, that's like, my opinion that's almost catastrophic um so i think all they need to do is focus on how hard they play they've got talent when they really put it together they've got guys that can do multiple things on the court they've got a lineup that can play on both sides of the floor um all that matters is them going out there and playing hard um playing the right way playing for each other and if they can do that, I think they'll get hot just like they did last year. But they've got to start there. And if they don't, no, like I said, nobody's going to feel sorry for them losing four games in a row. Their next game, the team's going to come out and try to do the same thing to them and make it five. So I think that's what they need to focus. And I'm sure Coach Davis is, is drilling that in practice and in their meetings and film or whatever. Um, but hopefully they can do that, get things back on track. Perfect timing. You mentioned Georgia Tech, Carolina's next game back at home Saturday in Chapel Hill against the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. And then on Tuesday, they host the Citadel. We will be back after those two games next week. Appreciate everybody watching and listening. Justin, appreciate the time as always, man. I appreciate you, man.